show that urban sorry, indigenous peoples are eight times more likely than non-indigenous to be homeless. And that number is even higher in Northern communities where most of the population is indigenous. Indigenous homelessness is different. As scholar Jesse Thistle states, indigenous peoples often feel their family is their home, making the loss of family, culture and language major components to Indigenous homelessness. This homelessness is what leads to houselessness. The Cashelgotney Housing Society in the community of Fort Good Hope Northwest Territories are witnessing a housing crisis. They realized that about 16% of their population was homeless, which was causing overcrowding in many of the homes or sleeping rough in and around the community. Just to give you an idea of what 16% looks like in a community of this size, it equals 88 citizens out of a population of 550. Solving homelessness is not just a matter of building houses to put people in. Although it would help, it's just not enough. To really help with Indigenous homelessness, people need healing. And we are seeing a gap in programs offered in remote Northern communities. The Transitional Home for Men will provide programs directed towards healing and education putting permanent programs in place to address addictions, family violence, the collective trauma of residential school, but has also led to intergenerational trauma. Securing affordable, sustainable housing while working on physical and spiritual health has proven to be a major factor in successfully helping Indigenous houseless people find and sustain a home. My research allows me to work collectively, collaboratively with Kashugatni Housing Society and the community to continue with their transitional housing plan designed to incorporate the life skills programs that they, as they house the homeless, thereby relieving the stress of overcrowding that is present in the community. My goal is to build a plan that incorporates various programs presently being used in northern urban centers but alter them so they can be used in a way that would best fit the community of Fort Good Hope. The intention of this study is not only to benefit the community of Fort Good Hope, but to be developed as a model to benefit other remote communities throughout the North. Thank you. Much, Veronica, for your presentation. Before we move on to the second participant, we're just going to give a few moments to the judges to take any notes. Uh, they may need to take. And my um, one of my tasks as the MC is to entertain everybody <laughs> during these breaks. Francesca, I'm just going to step in for a second, just uh, say a few housekeeping things. Um, you may notice that we have the chat open. Um, we just wanted to make it accessible for everybody. Um, I did send out uh, information to the judges and to the participants and to Francesca, but just want to let the audience know that um, you're free to use the chat, but if you could refrain from doing that while the presentations are happening, just to avoid distractions. And um, we've asked everyone to keep their cameras off as well, just for bandwidth, except for Francesca. Uh, but feel free at the end, um, I want to, after I put the judges in the breakout session, um, certainly the judges themselves and anybody else who wants to be on camera can. Thanks, Francesca. Julie, that is very helpful. I think, Julie, we can probably move on to the second participant now. Perfect. So the next participant is Timai Han Do. He's doing a Master of Education in the Faculty of Education. The title of the thesis is An Investigation and Development of Policies to Improve Institutional Autonomy in Vietnamese University. Over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. My topic relates to the university autonomy in Vietnam. I will use the, the abbreviated form of the term university autonomy at UA. My presentation will uh, is designed to answer three questions. Number one, why I carry out, why do I carry out this thesis? Recently, the Vietnamese government has legalized 
the UA in the law number 34 in 2019. Uh, many universities are now facing many difficulty and confusing to implement this policy. There are no studies uh, completed to evaluate the brand new issue policy. So this is my task. Will go. It is my my goal to examine the policy and uh, suggest to improve the Vietnamese law. Yeah, and um, to achieve this goal, the understanding on the UA and the Memorial University Act are required. What are my findings based on the research result? Uh, be I will evaluate for the policy of UA in Vietnam. Besides some advantages, such, such as the support, the strong support of the government to the UA policy, the legalization of the UA, and the full regulation on the on the components of the UA. Besides, we got two big drawbacks. The first, an indispensable feature of the UA had not been understood correctly. That is, the government still have the obligation to provide the uh, funding for the university. But in fact, the regulations tend to ignore it and assume that university must be self-funded to be autonomous. And the second thing is the existing law and the law number 34 are in conflict. So what are my recommendations? There are three things I recommend. First, the government must confirm in the law that they still have the obligation to provide the funding for the, or the university. The second, it is very necessary to review and amend the law relating to the UA policy to ensure the consistent application of the UA in Vietnam. And the third, I learned from the the, the, the appearance of the Memorial University Act that they as a check the government issue individual acts uh, for certain certain specific university based on their strengths, not issuing in general a collective act like uh, at present. So that is my presentation. Thank you for your listening. Thank you so much, Timai, for your presentation today, and it was lovely to hear about your uh, thesis uh, today. Thanks. You know, to all of the participants, it is so nice uh, to still be able to do this presentation, uh, these presentations remotely this year. Normally, we have the 3MT competition in person at month, but this time it is working quite well to do this online. So it is really wonderful to hear about all of your research projects. Just going to give a few seconds to the judges and then we're going to move on to the next participant. Can we move on to the next? Perfect. So the next participant today is Marzana Monefa, who's doing a Master of Science in Biochemistry in the Faculty of Science. The title of Marzana's thesis is Hydrolysis Products Generated by Lipoprotein Lipase and Their Association with NADPH Oxidase. Over to you, Marzana. We all love sharing meals with our beloved ones, enjoying delicious fast foods that are indulged with unhealthy fats. But we may be not be concerned of a silent thread around the corner until it's too late. I still remember the worst day of my life when my father was at ICU due to a major heart attack. I was terrified that I might never get to see him again. That is the reason I became more enthusiastic about understanding the biochemical processes leading to a heart attack. Do you know, according to Canadian Chronic Disease Surveillance, 
Heart diseases are the second leading cause of death in Canada. And I was shocked to find it's number one in Newfoundland, where atherosclerosis plays a big role. You may be wondering what is atherosclerosis. Our arteries are like pipes that transports blood with oxygen and nutrients to every cell of our body. Over time, mostly due to eating unhealthy fats, the space inside our arteries can start getting clogged with fats. This clogging restricts the flow of oxygen supply to the cells in our body, leading to cellular death. And when this block happens in the heart arteries, the consequences are getting a heart attack. Now, how can we stop buildup of these clogs made of fats? There are treatments available, but they have not been much effective. That explains why heart diseases are still a major challenge all around the world. So how can we develop more effective treatments, you may ask. For this to happen, we need to understand all the series of molecular interactions step by step taking place in the development of these fatty clogs in our arteries. This is when my research comes into play. I am developing a cell model that will give us more insights on the underlying mechanism of atherosclerosis using our immune cells called macrophages. Even though they're widely known as heroes in our body to save from foreign invaders like viruses and bacteria, but in case of heart diseases, they're found to promote atherosclerosis. Previous studies have linked oxidative stress to atherosclerosis. The cells, just like us, experience stresses too. Therefore, I'm going to measure the stress chemicals known as reactive oxygen species that are produced primarily by an enzyme called NADPH oxidase. This will be my target. I will be blocking the activity of this enzyme to see if I can reverse atherosclerosis in my model or not. And if it is successful, macrophage-specific drugs can be developed as a novel treatment to protect all our loved ones in a world having more risk than ever for heart diseases due to the lockdown of COVID-19. Thank you. Much, uh, Marzana, for your interesting presentation as well. And you know, I should have mentioned when I was doing my introduction that if I mispronounce any of the titles of the thesis or any of the participants' name, please accept my apologies in advance, as we didn't have a chance to talk uh, beforehand. Uh, I may mispronounce um, some of these things uh, today throughout the, um, the event. We're just going to give a few seconds to the judges once again before we move on. Okay, Julie, can we move on to the next participant? Thank you. So the next participant today is uh, Indrayani Faltare, who's doing a Master of Science in Biochemistry in the Faculty of Science. And the topic of this is, is uh, Wealth in Waste, Potential Anti-Obesity Effects of Shrimp Oil Extracted from Shrimp Waste. Over to you, Indrayani. Uh, hello, everyone. So before I start explaining my research, I would like you to remember three things, okay? Shrimp, vitamins, and health benefits. Newfoundland and Labrador has the highest rate of obesity in all of Canada. So utilizing local natural resources to target obesity will not only improve health of the population, but it will also improve economy of province. Luckily, we have such a resource, which is readily available in Newfoundland. And that's shrimp. The focus of my research is to explore the health benefits, such as anti-obesity effects of a shrimp that is found in cold waters of Newfoundland. Shrimp is a marine species that is commonly processed for commercial use. However, shrimp processing generates significant amount of shrimp waste. Talking about shrimp, it might interest you to know that about 60% of shrimp harvest goes towards the waste. And to put that in perspective, that's more than 6,000 metric tons of shrimp waste every year. Fortunately, this shrimp waste is a rich source of a different value-added products, such as shrimp oil and astaxanthin. Now, what is astaxanthin? 
Astaxanthin is a carotenoid. That means it belongs to the same class as of vitamin A and has almost 100 times greater antioxidant potential compared to vitamin A, C, and E. Interesting, right? Therefore, extraction of this astaxanthin-rich shrimp oil from shrimp waste appears to be an ideal strategy in order to use this shrimp waste for better purpose. And here my research comes in picture, where I'm using this shrimp waste to extract shrimp oil by using different methods of extractions. And then further, I'm investigating its effect on fat accumulation by using fat cells called 33L1 cells. So far, what we observed is this shrimp oil from shrimp waste reduces the fat accumulation by reducing the factors that are actually involved in fat synthesis and storage. And this is clearly very interesting for us. Therefore, I'm further interested to investigate the mechanisms through which it can prevent the obesity. Overall, these findings will be of a great significance in order to target the obesity and also to improve the economy of province by introducing a value-added product that can be utilized towards aquaculture, or human and animal health. So, for now, try eating more shrimps. Maybe that will help. Thank you. Much, Indriani, and I believe we had some technical issues um, on Julie's hand for the slide that you shared. So, apologies um, for Indriani. We'll just give a few extra seconds for all of the audience and the judges to have a a clear look at your slide. Sure. The slide on our screen, but it didn't come up on um, our screen, so there may be some technical issue there. So, really, apologies for that. Now we're going to move on to the next participant. Julie, would you mind uh, switching to the next slide? Thank you so much. So the next participant today is uh, Chiron Power. Chiron is doing a Master of Science in Neuroscience in the Faculty of Medicine. And the title of the thesis is uh, Firing Mode Specific Functions of the Locus Cerulus Heterogeneity Within the Basolateral Amygdala. Over to you, Chiron. All right, so the fight or flight response is a common is a concept commonly introduced in intro psychology courses. An example is typically given is you encounter some threat in the environment. So say a bear or a lion, and this kind of kickstarts the fight or flight response, which is also known as the activation of the sympathetic nervous system. What's less commonly known is that this activation of the sympathetic nervous system is actually also occurring whenever we see something that we like. So this is why, for instance, when you look at a loved one, your pupils might dilate and you might feel the butterflies in your stomach, as we say. It turns out that the same brain area, known as the locus ceruleus, or LC for short, is involved in both our responses to stressors and rewards. Now, one of the differences in these two types of responses might be the type of activation, also known as firing, uh, in the LC. So the LC has two types of firing. Uh, activity can be continuous or bursting. So to demonstrate this in the lab, we use a fancy neuroscience technique called optogenetics, which is basically using light to activate brain areas of interest to see what results behaviorally or in the brain. We've previously shown that we can train a rat to like a certain smell if we previously pair that smell with the bursting LC activation. On the other hand, we can train a rat to fear a certain smell by previously pairing it with continuous LC activation. So my work comes in at this point and asks, what is happening in the brain in these two different scenarios? What we found is that when the LC is engaged in bursting firing, one part of the amygdala, the amygdala being commonly known in its involvement uh, in fear and other emotions, is becoming activated. Whereas when the LC is engaged in continuous firing, a different part of the amygdala becomes activated. So why is this important? Well, there's a growing consensus that one of the reasons why our treatments for fear and anxiety related disorders are not very effective, and also one of the reasons why we haven't seen many recent advancements in treatment options for these types of disorders 
is because we lack a fundamental understanding of what things like fear and anxiety actually are in the brain. So my work is adding to our basic understanding of what makes up things like pleasure and fear in the brain, which is an important step towards being able to better reduce or recreate these states in humans. Thank you. much, uh, Karen, for your presentation today and for telling us about your research project uh, that you're conducting here at Memorial. And you know, this is, I believe it is the fourth time that I am the MC for the thesis uh, for this 3MT competition. And every year I get more and more surprised by all of the wonderful uh, research projects that our students are conducting here at MUN. So really love to hear about each and every one of them. Julie, can we move on to the next participant? Thank you. So the next participant is uh, Samantha Lehman, who is doing a PhD in English in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. The title of Samantha's thesis is Traumas, They Surround Us, Examining Women, Trauma, and Love in the Mists of Avalon and the Mortar Tour. Over to you, Samantha. When traumas happen to us, they are often a tipping point, moments of change and shake our worldviews. But when they happen in popular culture, we tend to seek out more. We demand more angst, more drama, more trauma. And we live to see our favorite characters twist and turn with the trials and tribulations of it all. Pop culture, far from being mere escapism, serves as a starting point to discuss current and social cultural topics, including, but not limited to, sexual assault, abuse, feminism, and equality. But what does all of that have to do with King Arthur? Well, actually everything. My research focuses on the link between love-based traumas inflicted by or upon female characters found within the canon of medieval Arthurian literature and its relevant modern adaptations. The Legend of King Arthur has been adapted countless times. Versions you might be familiar with include Disney's Sword in the Stone, Mark Twain's A Connecticut Yankee, John Borman's Excalibur, and the recent Netflix adaptation Cursed. All of these adaptations share certain features. For one, they are all part of the subgenre of medieval studies known as medievalism, which looks at how aspects of the medieval world manifest themselves in works from other time periods, including our own. Another element that several of these adaptations I just named share is how they tend to prioritize male-centric narratives, cursed, of course, being the exception. The male-centric narrative isn't surprising, given that Sir Thomas Mallory's The Mort d'Arthur is the Arthurian adaptation that we tend to draw most inspiration from. Mallory's text focuses intensely on the life and eventual death of Arthur, and while it does not delve deeply into the backstory of Arthurian women, it did inspire another text that does that work. That book was Marion Zimmer Bradley's The Mists of Avalon. Within my research, I used Mallory's The Mort d'Arthur and Bradley's novel to explore and expose how we navigate trauma in medieval and modern contexts. I deploy theories of adaptation, medievalism, and trauma to assess the evolution of portraying trauma and examine how these portrayals often reflect or reject modern social and cultural senses of accountability and activism. I chose specifically to work with Mallory and Bradley due to their own complicated histories as they are both alleged abusers in their own rights. Exploring their works in light of movements like Me Too demands a critical look at the exploitation of trauma that their works perpetuate even after their deaths. I seek to metaphorically give Arthurian women a seat at the round table through my research and to leave them to not be pigeonholed as saints or sinners, villains or victims. My work delves into the nuances of how female characters from Arthurian works experience and engage with trauma, giving them depth and space to process whatever authors see fit to inflict upon them. Thank you. Much, Samantha, for letting us know about your uh, research project. And it is always nice for me to hear uh, from projects in the Department of English, uh, because that was my home department before I started working full-time at Memorial, and I'm actually finishing my own PhD uh, thesis in the Department of English. So, so it's really nice to hear about other students from that department, as well as from all of you who are today here with us talking about your thesis. Just gonna wait a few seconds.
Julie, can we please move to the next? Thank you so much. So the next participant is uh, Yalo Martin, who's doing a Master of Science in Psychology in the Faculty of Science. The title of the thesis is Contributions of Androgen Action Within the Omer Nasal Organ for Sexual Differentiation of the Brain and Behavior. Over to you, Yalo. I'd like you all to think about someone you're attracted to. What attracts you to them? Is it their smile, their physique, their intellect? What about their smell? What if I told you that love could literally be in the air? Today, I'd like to talk to you about a little organ situated in the olfactory system that plays a huge role in mate choice and sexual preference through pheromone processing. In a rodent, if you were to pull back the roof of the mouth, you would expose the vomeronasal organ, or the VNO for short. In mice, this organ is about the size of a grain of rice. Evolutionarily, the VNO is a potential biological explanation for our sexual preferences. This organ connects to a circuit in the brain, which when manipulated, can induce changes in social, sexual, and or aggressive behaviors. Some of the changes one might see could be male mice displaying a sexual preference for other males, or female mice displaying male typical behaviors such as mounting. These sociosexual behaviors are also largely influenced by sex hormones, such as the androgen testosterone. These hormones can shape the brain and behavior in early periods in development, known as critical periods. Simply providing androgens to females or suppressing androgens in males on the day of birth can drastically change adult behavior and can cause long-term or permanent changes in the neuroanatomical pathway underlying sociosexual behavior. Since both the VNO and sex hormones affect change in the neural circuitry and behaviors individually, we wanted to determine if they work together. So, is the VNO a site of androgen action? To do this, we provided a micro-injection of testosterone to the VNO on the first day of birth in most pups to see if this was sufficient to affect sociosexual behavior. The mice then underwent three behavioral tests when they reached the age of maturity, which is shown on my slide. These tests ensured their main olfactory system was not compromised, assessed their sexual preference, and analyzed their behavioral response to opposite sex partners. We found that we were indeed able to affect sociosexual behavior through an increase in male typical aggressive behaviors. This research demonstrates how manipulating sex hormones within the VNO affects the brain and behavior. Though these results are preliminary, it is clear that the potential for discovery with this organ is so vast. A prime example of this is that although there is much debate over pheromone usage in humans, it has been suggested that it may be the absence of this organ that has allowed for the evolution of same-sex attraction among all Caterin species, including humans. Thank you so much. such a fascinating uh, introduction to your research project. Today, can we move on to the next? Thank you. So next participant today is uh, Sarah Torville, who's doing a Master of Science in Neuroscience in Faculty of Medicine. And the title of the thesis is Understanding Differential Roles of Stress and Enrichment in Pathogenesis of Alzheimer's Disease in a Novel Rat Town Model. Over to you, Sarah. Hi there. Um... How many of you have had a stressful day before? I imagine everyone here will raise their hands to that. <laughs> and how many of you have known someone affected by Alzheimer's disease? I imagine most of you would also raise your hands to that. And that's because Alzheimer's disease is the leading cause of dementia. It is incurable and we actually all have its building blocks in our brains. 
there is a protein called tau that's in our brains. And when it becomes mutated, it actually starts to accumulate within the cells, eventually forming tangles known as neurofibrillary tangles. And that is one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. It takes decades for this to occur from start to finish. So it actually starts happening very early in life. In some people within the first decade of life, and in all of us, or most of us, sorry, by the time we reach our 20s. So why don't we all get Alzheimer's if this is happening in everyone? To start answering that, my lab actually developed a rat model of Alzheimer's disease by taking that mutated protein and putting it into the brains of those rats and testing them in an odor discrimination test. Um, the sense of smell is actually the, one of the first things to be affected in Alzheimer's patients. And our mutated protein animals um, were unable to distinguish between the two similar odors when normal animals could. So now that we have this model, we can start to answer, we can start to ask more, more specific questions. And I'm asking, how do our life events, our days full of stress or days full of joy, influence our chances of getting Alzheimer's disease later in life? And to do that, I'm implementing stress and enrichment protocols in these animals, either early in life, just after birth, or later in life during adulthood, and seeing how that influences their development of symptoms and how it changes the progression of the spread of that mutant protein in their brains. Now, this is still ongoing. There's lots of testing still left to be done, but our preliminary results have actually indicated that the timing of these events is important in determining how they affect the symptom development. For example, um, enrichment later in life actually reduces anxiety levels, but enrichment early in life does not. It does, however, improve spatial memory. This, along with the other information that we are currently accumulating, will all, will all help us better understand the earliest, most critical stages of Alzheimer's disease. And then we can use that information um, to identify risk factors in your lifestyle, develop treatment methods, develop early screening tests, or maybe even prevent the onset of the disease altogether. So ultimately, this research could lead to the cure for Alzheimer's disease. Thank you. Much, Sarah. And I guess the um, cons of using a platform like WebEx is that you couldn't see all the people raising their hands, but hopefully you saw mine, and I'm sure that everybody was doing the same, even though their cameras was were off. Just going to wait a few seconds before we move on to the next participant. Just want to interrupt for a second there, Francesca, just to uh, remind everyone to keep their mics muted as the presentation is happening. Thank you. Actually, Julie, yes, yeah, very important. We don't want to disrupt any of the participants. So just a reminder to everyone, please uh, make sure you're muted throughout. Of course, unless you're presenting <laughs> that specific moment. Julie, can we move on? Thank you. So the next participant for today is uh, Julie Reimer, who's uh, doing a PhD in geography in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. And the title of the thesis is Amplifying the Potential of Marine Spatial Planning for Conservation and Sustainability. Over to you, Julie. Five years ago, for the first time ever, the United Nations released a major sustainability goal dedicated to our oceans. envisions a healthy ocean through seven targets that aim to reduce pollution, protect oceans, sustain fisheries, and more. It is an ambitious goal. And though we know that because oceans connect our economies, affect our climate, and feed the world, this goal is essential to a sustainable planet. But these lofty targets make us wonder, how do we get there? My PhD research looks to our most common ocean management tools to understand their potential for helping us get to SDG 14. But first, let's talk about these tools. What do marine protected areas and fisheries closures have in common? They both assess activities in specific places. My research looks to seven of these area-based management tools from our ocean management toolbox. Area-based management tools deliver different outcomes that can help us get to SDG 14. So first we need to understand what are these outcomes 
And how confident can we but be that they will be delivered? In my research, I collected evidence from nearly 200 studies and 75 experts to understand this confidence in key outcomes like increasing the size of fish or preserving traditions. I found that there tends to be high confidence in ecological outcomes, more so than social and economic outcomes. What this means is that targets that aim to improve that ecological system are more likely to benefit from our toolbox. I also found that tools that regulate more than one ocean activity in a shared space hold the most potential to get us to SDG 14. What was more surprising is that a lesser known tool called the locally managed marine area that really centers local needs holds more potential to get us to targets that focus on the social and economic system. This shows us how important local perspectives are in a sustainable ocean. By understanding how to get to SDG 14, I also uncovered some important gaps in our toolbox. These tools are not really able to help us with big targets like for pollution, like plastic or ocean acidification, which is what happens when the ocean absorbs too much carbon. What this means is that not all ocean problems can be solved using ocean management tools. Through my work, I've been able to show something that scientists have long understood. It is not enough to manage just one ocean activity at a time. Our oceans and the economies, biodiversity, and the people depending on them need us and our tools to work together. Thank you. Really for uh, such an interesting presentation today. It's really great to see all of the participants' enthusiasm for their research projects. Makes me want to talk to all of you uh, later on to know more about your research. Just going to wait a few seconds. Julie, can we move on to the next slide? Thank you. So the next participant today is uh, Tamu Natonia Omuluabi, who is doing a Master of Science in Neuroscience in the Faculty of Medicine here at MAN. The title of the thesis is The Effects of Locus Cerulus Neural Activity Pattern in a Pretangle Taurat Model. Over to you, Tamu Natonia. What if sometime in line, this child that once brought joy to this mother now becomes a stranger to her because she can no longer recognize a child? Now, if you're wondering if I'm talking about Alzheimer's disease, then you're right. Alzheimer's disease is a slowly progressive disease that affects the nerve cells of the brain and disrupts its normal function and leads to things that we commonly see as memory loss. According to the World Health Organization, about 44 million people are currently living with this disease. Now, this is more than the total number of people living in Canada. So while the actual number, the actual cause of this disease is unknown, in 2011, a scientist named Brack worked with over 2,000 dead human brains and discovered that they have accumulation of abnormal protein called tau. Tau in its normal state is a soluble protein, which means it dissolves and it helps structures in the cell to carry out the activities. But as seen in Alzheimer's disease patients, this protein forms tangles or thread-like structures that spread towards all brain areas. Brack also discovered that this disease starts in a part of the brain called the locus cerulus or LC, which produces chemical messengers that helps us in learning and memory. He also discovered something striking that these tangles were seen even in 40-year-olds just think about this for a minute. How often do we hear that 40 year olds have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease? The age we hear is from 65 and above where we see memory loss. And unfortunately at that stage, it is, actually, it is already irreversible. So why is there a gap over two to three decades? So my research aims to identify factors that will influence early stage of Alzheimer's disease and probably identify strategies that could help us to prevent the onset of this disease. So we work with rats. And what we did, we put a form of this abnormal protein 
into the LC of the rat. And we use a process where we use light to monitor the activities of the local cellulose. It's so interesting to see how the rats that have gone through this stage are now showing better learning and memory skill. The significance of this study is that it can be translated into human or Zeman's research since it uses a technique that enhances brain function that could probably reverse or slow down Alzheimer's disease. We are hoping that one day we'll put a stop to the pain that results from this disease and try to keep the smiles and laughter in the family. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tamona Tonia, for your uh, introduction to your thesis today. It's so impressive to see all of your presentations today. You're all doing such a great job of presenting. Just going to wait a few seconds. Judy, could we please move on to the next slide? Thank you so much. So the next participant today is uh, Mahesha Aziri Wardana, uh, who's doing a, B a PhD in biochemistry in the Faculty of Science. Uh, and the title of the thesis is uh, Amino Acid Nutrition in Development. Over to you, Mahesha. Hi, everyone. In my PhD project, I'm working on a novel promising supplement called Gordon Acetate. So what is this Gordon Acetate supplement? So how it differs from other supplements floating around the market. So this GAA, that is a short term of golden acetate, is made up of amino acids. So this golden acetate helps to produce another important substance called creatine. I think you may have heard of creatine supplements because it's a very popular nutritional supplement among athletes and bodybuilders. They are using creatine to improve their muscle mass and energy balance. What's wrong with these creatine supplements? They are very expensive and they are not stable during the manufacturing process. So to overcome those problems, we can use GA as an alternative source because creatine is made up of GA molecules. Therefore, in recent research studies, researchers have shown there are a lot of benefits towards the animal industry and humans so they have been showing GA can enhance growth rate, meat quality, and performance of commercial animals, especially targeting on pigs and poultry. Apart from animal industry, GA can enhance exercise performance, physical performance in humans as well. Therefore, we were interested to look at what happened to these GA supplements inside our body in relation to other amino acids. To demonstrate this, we are using piglets as a model because they have kind of similar digestive system as the humans. Uh, to get the best benefits out of GA supplements, it needs to be converted into creatine. So for this conversion, it needs another essential amino acid called methionine. As I have shown in this screen, you can see methionine plays important role in this conversion. If our diet contains low level of methionine because we cannot produce methionine in our body, it reduces conversion and thereby decrease all the creatine related functions. Therefore, we have given pigs with different levels of methionine with the GA supplements, we were able to demonstrate how this conversion affects the creatine production and thereby its related functions. Interestingly, we were able to find out Methionine is important to GA absorption through the gut as well. So, methionine is important to GA conversion as well as GA absorption to the gut. So, by conclusion, I want to emphasize, if you want to get the best out of GA supplements, you have to take enough dietary methionine as well. Thank you. Thanks, Mahesha, for telling us about your PhD project that we are conducting uh, here at Memorial. We're just going to wait a few moments.
Julie, can I move to the next slide? Thank you so much. And the next participant is uh, Tian Shuang Han, who is doing a Master of Science in Psychology in the Faculty of Science. The title of the thesis is Examining Layperson Perceptions of Police Tactics in Suspect Interrogation. Over to you, Tian Shuan. Since coming to Canada last year, I've learned a lot about what police can do and what they can't do while interviewing suspects. Given concerns over false confessions, the police is not allowed to promise a lenient sentence to the suspect. However, implied leniency is generally accepted by the court. Minimization is a series of admissible interrogation tactics, where the interrogator minimizes the seriousness of the crime to get the suspect's trust. Alarmingly, research has shown that minimization can pragmatically imply leniency. In other words, the police wouldn't promise a lenient sentence directly. They would let the suspect read between the lines. For example, at the scenario shown in the slide, the police may downplay the consequences of confessing, saying things like, when I look at your case, I think you're fine. You don't really have to be worried. It sounds supportive, but the suspect could therefore interpret it as the equivalent of a leniency being offered, and that can well trap innocent people to falsely confess. More concerning things is, jurors usually cannot tell that when they look at the confession evidence. Although field study has shown that expert testimony could be helpful on confession to the jurors, however, the courts do not allow the expert to assist the jurors with those issues because they doubt the testimony wouldn't go beyond the common sense of lay people. So with all this in mind, I'll conduct a study to examine layperson perceptions of minimization tactics. Instead of a suspect, my research focused on people who are not involved in the interrogation and would help to see how those prospective jurors evaluate confession, uh, evaluate minimization. The results has found that some minimization tactics are perceived as coercive. However, others are believed to be less problematic, which suggests that people do not fully understand the connection between minimization and the false confession. More importantly, confession had a really strong impact on jurors' decisions. People would convict the suspect even when they thought the confession was coerced. Taken together, it suggests that jurors may not be able to evaluate the confession under common sense. And expert testimony should be allowed to help them. So hopefully, my research could help to decrease the rate of false confession being used in legal decisions and prevent wrongful convictions, which is really important to the society because innocent lives depends on it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tian Shuan, for telling us about your very interesting uh, project. Right now, we're actually about halfway through the participants, the list of participants for today, halfway through the presentations. So we still have a few more to listen to. Just going to wait a second. Judy, can we please move to the next person? Thank you very much. So the next participant today is uh, Anthony Dura Silva, who is doing a PhD in biochemistry in the Faculty of Science. And the title of the thesis is uh, Isomorphism, Cold Adaptation, and uh, Phosphorylation of Sarcomeric Tropomyosin. Over to you. Sensitivity to temperature determines the success of an organism in a particular habitat, and this is caused by the susceptibility of biochemical and physiological processes. As a result, temperature is a key factor that determines the biogeographic range limits of organism. Although it is like that, we know almost all corners of the world are occupied by organisms. This is due to the differences that gives them the adaptations to thrive different temperatures. These adaptations sometimes are very obvious and can be seen in the external appearance. 
or else sometimes these differences and the adaptations are found hidden under the skin at biomolecular level. Talking about biomolecules, proteins play an important role in structure and function of organisms. The proteins have an optimum temperature range where they can function properly. Beyond that, they reach a breaking point due to the loss of the native structure. But proteins try to maintain the native structure with structural differences to face different temperature uh, functions. These structural differences oftentimes are caused by single amino acid substitutions. So today I'm going to talk to you about my research that focuses on such an amino acid difference of a protein that enables the protein to function at vastly different temperatures. When we look at all the organisms, in the muscles of organisms, there's a protein called trypomycin. Trypomycin is very important to maintain the contraction of the muscles. And when you look at the trypomycin function of Atlantic salmon, which is a cold-blooded organism, uh, which lives in zero degrees temperature year round, close to zero degrees, as opposed to the mammal trypomycin, which has a body temperature close to 40, the function does not vary. So how is this possible? This is all due to a single amino acid substitution. In the mammals, in trypomycin, there's a positively, positively charged amino acid. This positively charged amino acid causes the trypomycin to become rigid. So what happens even if the temperature goes up, the molecule does not become too wiggly, so it still maintains its function. In turn, in the salmon, this is replaced by a neutral amino acid, so it disrupts several electrostatic interactions and disrupts the molecule itself. So what happens? Because of that, when the temperature goes down, the molecule does not become too rigid and it maintains its flexibility. So what happens? It can face the cold induced rigidity. So we can see one amino acid difference. It helps the molecule to function at two different temperatures uh, in, in giving the adaptations in the animal kingdom. Thank you. for telling us about your thesis and your research project um, here at one. Just going to wait a few seconds. Julie, can we please move to the next slide? Thank you. So the next participant is Mohammed Alauddin, who is doing a PhD in Process Engineering in the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science. Uh, and the title of the thesis is the Pandemic Risk Management Using the Engineering Safety Approaches. Over to you, Mohammed. Millions of people into extreme poverty and existential threat to many in a crisis. This is the biggest concern of the time. And so, if you agree, thank you. This is what that motivated my team to apply engineering knowledge for helping in better decision making. As Carl Wyman, a Nobel laureate, rightly said, education is about learning to make better decisions. My dear friends, individual, corporates, governments, all have to play together to fight this disease. Let's put in a similar context. Winter has arrived and we have the fear of exposure to excessive cold and harsh weather. So we use winter clothes and other accessories at individual level. Our employers and government help us by maintaining favorable conditions at public places and work sites. And ultimately, this condition would be gone by the next summer. Similarly, we have the fear of exposure to the coronavirus. A vaccine is the ultimate cure of the disease, but that's not available at the beginning of the outbreak. It takes several months, maybe a year. Thus, we have to do with other options such as wearing a mask, social distancing, 
school and business closures and lockdown. But we can't impose lockdown to longer duration due to its devastating impact on economy. We have to play wisely with a better sense of how imposing and relaxing of a measure will impact what will happen with the school closing and how it will affect after the opening. This is what we have tried to come up with our model that shows the range of number of critical cases over time. Suppose if we adopt in the school closures with 1000 ICU beds for a population of Ontario, then every one out of four person won't be able to avail the ICU facilities at peak time as shown in figure. So the number of ICUs must be increased if we are operating with this regulation. And this must be planned beforehand. And our model will help in that plan. Although a pandemic has uncertainty in spreading, uncertainty in infection and recovery period, nonetheless we can conquer it by responding well in advance rather than reacting at crucial times. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Mohammed, for talking to us about your research, which sounds like it is very timely right now. Just gonna wait a few seconds. Can we move on to the next slide? Thank you. So the next participant is uh, Janelle Skirt, who is doing an interdisciplinary PhD here at Memorial. And the title of the thesis is uh, Mining the Rock Towards a Benefit Sharing Framework for Human Genetic Research in Newfoundland and Labrador. Over to you, Janelle. More than 20 years ago, a group of researchers from Texas came to land. They took family their blood samples, then vanished. We call them the Texas vampires for fairly obvious reasons. They were wondering whether they carried a gene which, left untreated, would almost always mean certain death, possibly by age 30. Home to a founder population, a group of people descended from common ancestry. In genetic research, this gives researchers a fairly homogeneous or similar population and can make identifying genes or creating pharmaceuticals a little easier. The Newfoundland gene has been known as a valuable research resource for decades. The goal of my thesis is to determine whether we can conceptualize the Newfoundland genome in a way that is similar to other types of natural resources. And if we can, how can we ensure that developing it benefits the residents of this province? Newfoundlanders and Labradorians have always depended on natural resources for economic security. We have policy to make sure that the product benefits when outside companies come in and access those resources. We receive royalties, grant licenses, and make sure that our residents are given employment. However, no such benefit sharing framework exists for the Newfoundland genome. When you think about natural resources, you probably think about mining or fishing. But just because we describe the Newfoundland genome as a natural resource doesn't mean that it fits the definition perfectly. We need to carefully consider the ways in which the Newfoundland genome is similar to, but different from other types of natural resources. You see, genes aren't really things, but they're also not really people either. They fall in a strange gray area. And this is why it's important to look at the rules we have in place for other natural resources to see what fits, what doesn't. Genetic research is quite different from mining, even though we actually have been described as a genetic gold mine. The purpose of my research is to make sure that what happened in the 1990s never happens again. To make sure that the people of this province have a stake in how this valuable resource is developed. Ultimately, I want to ensure that the next proverbial vampire knocks on our door, we're able to ask a few questions and talk about possible benefits before we invite them in. Thank you. Uh, 
Al, for talking to us about your research project. Just going to wait a few more seconds. Julie, can we please move to the next? Thank you, Julie. The next participant is uh, Kelly McDonald, who is doing a Master of Science in Biology in the Faculty of Science. And the title of the thesis is uh, Movers and Shakers, the Spread of Invasive Brown Trout, Salmo Truta, and their effects on Atlantic Salmon, Salmo Salar, on the island of Newfoundland. Over to you, Kelly. Fishing is one of the most popular outdoor activities in Newfoundland today, and people come from all over the world to partake in angling for prized salmon, trout, char, and other species. However, few people realize that though some of these fish seem like a natural part of the landscape, they are actually non-native or exotic species. The brown trout is the perfect example of a biological invasion. Native to Europe, it is a pervasive invader and has established itself all over the world. Now, all biological invasions can be divided into three steps, introduction, establishment, and spread. Brown trout was introduced to Newfoundland in the 1880s by British expatriates who wanted to be able to angle their favorite fish, and the trout soon established breeding populations on the Avalon Peninsula. Next, it began its geographic spread westward, where its furthest point, which is called the Invasion Front, is now located along the Buren and Bonavista peninsulas, which you can see denoted on my slide as the red line labeled 2020. Next, even though there are three steps to achieve invasion, one of the most important dimensions of a biological invasion are the effects on the receiving ecosystem. Invasive species can disrupt native food webs. They can change the composition of the communities, compete with similar species, and even cause the latter's local extinction. My research has first focused on determining exactly where the invasion front is and using this information to model the rate of spread of brown trout to better predict how and where they will invade in the future. The second objective of my research is to examine the potential effects of the brown trout invasion on local salmonids, such as Atlantic salmon and brook char. Salmon, char, and brown trout are closely related species, which means they potentially compete for resources such as habitat or prey. I will be analyzing the stomach contents of these species to discover how much overlap there is in their diets and how this affects their co-occurrence patterns. Though I'm still in the midst of data analysis, I can conclude from my fieldwork alone that the invasion front has not actually moved that much in the last 10 years, which was contrary to our predictions and indicates that the invasion is much slower than anticipated. This could be explained by Newfoundland's relatively low productivity rivers or the presence of, the presence of less suitable watersheds for brown trout invasion. Alternatively, a potential mechanism limiting the invasion of brown trout is the pre presence of native salmonids, who could be making it more difficult for trout to invade. Now, it is an integral that we study invasion, not only because models of spread are not yet accurate, but also because we still lack the ability to predict future biological invasions and the effects that they can have on the receiving ecosystems. My research is novel in that it not only studies one step of invasion, but holistically considers all three and ties them to the impacts that the invader has on the ecosystem. So next time you head out of the city, perhaps for a spot of fishing, you might want to look around you and think about the types of invasion that could be happening right under your nose. Thank you. Much, Kelly, for telling us about your very interesting research project today. Just going to wait a few seconds. Judy, can we please move to the next? Thank you. So the next participant is uh, Shreya Nimani, who is doing a Master of Science in Geography in the Faculty of Science. And the title of the thesis is A Species and Traits-Based Approach to Predicting the Distribution of Benthic Communities. And over to you, Shreya. 
I don't know about you guys, but with months of lockdown and potentially another resurgence, my itch for travel has grown. Desire to travel and see new places that we've never seen before is probably shared among all of us here. So what may be new to our eyes has likely been observed by countless others who visited the same sites before us. But for many parts of the oceans, this is not the case. Vast regions of the seabed are still unexplored, making it truly one of the last remaining frontiers on our planet. And advances in ocean technologies are helping us to see what happens under the sea. My research seeks to leverage the power of sound and imagery to capture the landscapes and wildlife occurring in coastal seas here in Placentia Bay. This is a region facing increasing human impacts from vessel traffic and industrial and commercial expansion, such as aquaculture. Yet in light of these changes, there is a lack of data describing the existing state and conditions of the seabed in the region. My goal is to establish a baseline describing the current state of habitats across select coastal sites, which is valuable to measure against any potential future impacts. I use acoustic data collected by sonar instruments, which emit sound waves to the seabed to derive information on the depth and other seabed properties. This is used to map the surface for vast regions of the seafloor in high resolution. But missing from this picture, what species occur and how are they assembled across the seabed? Here, underwater technology such as drop cameras will be used to visualize the organisms using point samples. Recognizing the time, effort, and cost required to endlessly sample species across the entire seabed I will use machine learning to predict their distribution from the video data. This is based on our understanding of how these organisms are influenced by seafloor characteristics, which can be modeled to predict their presence in one region as opposed to another. The final product seen here is a continuous map visualizing the types of species communities occurring across space. The next time you punch in a list of sites to visit on your trip, think of the marine equivalent. Imagine navigating the seabed from a community of common sea stars and urchins to a sandy bed full of mussels and clams. Aside from how cool that would be, their importance extends beyond some underwater exploration, interesting videos, and a map. The true value lies in planning and management, because how can we protect a region if we don't know what exists there? Well, these maps can tell us, which makes them essential for making informed decisions on how we use marine areas. Thank you. Thank you so much, for telling us about your research project. Just gonna wait for a moment. Julie, could we please move on to the next slide? Thank you. The next participant is uh, Michaela Swain, who is doing a Master of Science in Biology in the Faculty of Science. The title of the thesis is uh, Indirect Impacts of Non-Native Younglet Browsers on Soil Horizons in Microbial Communities in the Boreal Forest of Newfoundland. Over to you, Michaela. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear my intro. Am I ready to go? I'll take that as a yes. Sorry. I would like to start with a quick story. In 1904, Newfoundland was introduced to something never seen before, four moose from New Brunswick. People flocked to the railroad's edge to see these large animals as they made their way to Howley in the center of the island. They were brought in hopes to help develop the interior land bring large game hunters, and introduce a new food source for families. What was not known was that in about 100 years, the population would grow from four to an estimated 150,000 moose today. Due to their large number and size, moose are now key players in influencing ecosystem function through their impacts. Moose impacts can be split into two main categories, direct and indirect. Imagine you have three dominoes and you push the first one over. You directly impact it, causing it to fall, but you then indirectly impact the other two, causing them to fall without even having to touch them. 
Moose have three main direct impacts, consuming, defecating, and trampling. Within each of these direct impacts, they have a series of indirect impacts, and that's what I'm interested in. These indirect impacts can reach far into ecosystem function and change things that seem completely separate. About 20 years ago, large squared fenced areas were placed in locations around the island with healthy moose populations. These large fences keep moose out and allow us to compare and give us the unique ability to identify these impacts. Without these structures, it'd be nearly impossible to identify moose impacts. Often scientific focus of indirect impacts is on visual changes, such as a shift in plant community or plant height. These are easy to study, yet you can visually track and notice the changes with your own eyes. However, it's arguable that the most important impacts are the ones you can't even see. Soil is the foundation for a healthy ecosystem, and it's often overlooked. I'm interested in identifying and bringing light to the unknowns underground. My study uses a variety of complex field and lab methods, including soil cores, pitfall insect traps, soil nitrogen, carbon content, DNA extraction, chloroform fumigation, and more, to try to identify these changes to the soil. These methods focus on three main aspects, nutrient turnover, soil composition, and macro and microorganism communities. By looking at these three aspects, I can start to understand the flow of indirect impacts that might be happening here in Newfoundland. Each of these are important for healthy ecosystems. Um, moose have been changing the boreal forest for over 100 years now, and very little has been done to identify their impacts. By understanding where moose are impacting the soil, we can better control and identify future ecosystem changes that they may be having and implement important conservation efforts. It's important to remember that sometimes the most crucial changes are the ones you can't even see. Moose are here to stay and they've made Newfoundland their home. And it's now our job to make sure we understand their ability to change it. Thank you. For telling us about your research projects. We're just gonna wait a few seconds. Julie, could we please move to the next? Thank you. So the next participant is uh, Tristan Critch, who is doing a Master of Science in your science in the Faculty of Medicine. And the title of the thesis is The Functional Roles of L-Type Calcium Channels in Older Learning and Spatial Discrimination. Over to you, Tristan. I'm sure at some point or another in your life, you've experienced the misplacement of your keys or the inability to call what you've had for dinner the night before. These little slip ups are natural and are quite common. However, as we get older, our memories aren't quite what they used to be and our ability to teach old dogs new tricks becomes increasingly difficult. However, why we experience this cognitive decline as we age is not yet fully understood. And before we dive into this research, my research, we need a bit more background about calcium. When it comes to calcium, I'm sure you all know that it helps lead to the development of strong bones and healthy teeth. However, what you may not actually be aware of is that it actually plays a very intimate role in the process of learning and new memory formation. In order for the calcium ions to do their part in regards to the learning process, they first must be able to enter the cell. They do this by passing through these channels or selective gates that only allow calcium ions through, much like a cat door. From this in the past, it was hypothesized that an increased amount of calcium through a dysfunction of these channels leads to the cognitive decline that we see with age and is called the calcium hypothesis of brain aging, which leads us to my research hypothesis of that in young animals, the L-type calcium channels actually promotes and facilitates the learning process. However, in the aging animals, they lead to an impairment of the same processes. To explore this question, I employed an odor-based learning model in which the animals need to learn that one scent contains reward, while the other odor does not. Through the use of a nemotopine, which is an L-type calcium channel blocker, so it prevents their activation and they're unable to open to allow calcium through, I have shown that in young animals, when blocking the L-type calcium channels, it actually prevents their ability to learn this rule, while their control counterparts are able to do so with ease as shown by the graph. However, the striking difference is that in aging animals, when we block the L-type calcium channels, we actually promote the ability to learn this rule, while their control counterparts are unable to do this, 
which is a complete reversal of what we saw in the young animals, which suggests that L-type calcium channels actually have a differential role based on our age, suggesting to me that the L-type calcium channels may be in a part responsible for the cognitive decline that we see with age and thus act as a potential therapeutic target to alleviate the cognitive decline that we see with age. And thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Tristan, for telling us about your exciting uh, research project. Once again, we're just going to wait a few seconds. Julie, could we please move on to the next slide? Thank you. The next participant is uh, Mohsen Islami Nazari, who is doing a PhD in electrical engineering in the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science. The title of the thesis is uh, Electromagnetic Scattering from Layered Media. Over to you, Mohsen. Hello, everyone. Um, do you do you know how it would be great if we could able to live on other plan planets rather than the Earth? After the Mars, after the Earth, Mars is the most habitable planet in our solar system due to the chance of existing water on this planet. Everywhere there is water, there is life. But the question is that how can we detect water on this on the red planet? The answer of this question is using radar technology. Radar is a detection system propagating electromagnetic waves and analyzing backscatter waves. NASA has installed radars on four spacecrafts orbiting around Mars in order to detect water beneath the surface of Mars. As we can see in figure one, it should be noted that soil is a layered medium and in order to detect and find water beneath the surface, we need to find and determine the characteristic of each layer, as we can see in figure number two. And we need to do it remotely by using radar and propagating electromagnetic waves. In my research, I have modeled this kind of layered medium, as we can see in figure number three. And the characteristic of each layer is represented by three parameters in this figure. In other words, by finding these parameters, we can say which material we have. And in this way, we can detect water. The first parameter is permittivity or epsilon. The next one is conductivity or sigma. And the last one is permeability or mu. Let me make an example. For seawater, epsilon is 81, sigma is four, and permeability is four pi times to the 10, 10 to the minus seven. If we found these values, definitely we can say that we have water at that layer. Also in my research and in my thesis, I'm going to propose closed form solutions for the electromagnetic scattering above these layered media in order to detect water and in order to determine the characteristic of each layer. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, you are a PhD researcher here at Memorial. We're just going to wait a few moments. Julie, could we please move on to the next slide? Thank you very much. The next participant for today is uh, Aida Mazia, who is doing a Master of Science in Neurosciences the Faculty of Medicine. The title of the thesis is uh, Age-Dependent Changes of Synaptic and Extrasynaptic L-type Calcium Channel and NMDA Receptors in Rats. Over to you, Aida. So babies in medieval art all had one thing in common. They don't look like babies. Instead, they mostly resemble a miniature version of middle-aged men. Right after Renaissance, art artists start realizing that babies are not just a smaller version of an adult. They have a longer trunk, shorter limbs, and bigger heads. This Renaissance in medicine has occurred just 50 years ago, that neuroscientists came to know that although young children are extremely capable in many ways, 
their memory capacity is very limited compared to an adult. That's why we almost don't remember anything from our early childhood. The first thing to understand about memory formation is that memories are not stored as physical things. In order to remember something, neurons, which are the cells in our brain, must communicate with each other through a special structure called synapse. Synapse is an area where two neurons come close enough to one another that they become able to send electrical signals. These signals are created by ion channels that physically transfer ion into the cells. While synaptic ion channels help retain our memories, extrasynaptic ones are responsible for weakening the connection between neuronal cells. Extrasynaptic ion transmission causes the signal between the neurons to be broken, and the formation of new memories cannot happen. In our lab, with rats' brain, since surprisingly, human and rats' brain are more alike than different. And after doing various experiments, we have found that the number of extrasynaptic ion channels is statistically higher in a newborn brain than in a middle-aged one, leading to disruption of neurological pathway and lack of memory retention in the young ones. Our finding can be an explanation to the mystery of why we can remember being a baby, from the most dramatic moment in life, the day of our birth, to first step, first words, and first food. Thank you. Thank you, Aida, for telling us about your very interesting research project. We're just gonna wait a few seconds, and we still have four more participants for today's uh, 3MT. Julie, can we move on to the next slide? Thank you. The next participant is uh, Marco Schmielski, who is doing a Master of Science in Geology in the Faculty of Science. The title of the thesis is the Geology, Alteration, and the Little Geochemistry of the Goldboro Orogenic Out Deposit, Nova Scotia. Over to you, Marco. What if, in order to find that remote you lost deep in the couch, you didn't actually need to find it at all? Now, that may seem like an incredibly weird concept, but it's one that gold mining and mineral exploration companies ask themselves on a regular basis. Gold is one of the most sought after resources of all time. It's used in coins, jewelry, and even your cell phones and computers. But with an ever increasing global population and demand, the Earth's natural abundance of gold is slowly diminishing. Now, I'm not saying we're gonna run out anytime soon, we're not but we've basically found all of the mind-bogglingly large gold deposits that there are in the world. And what's left are smaller, lower grade deposits uh, that just have less gold in them. And most of them are located deep underground. Imagine trying to find something hundreds of meters to kilometers beneath your feet without actually being able to see it. One of the biggest costs for gold exploration is finding the gold itself. Because these deposits are underground, we need to drill deep into the earth to find them. Drilling produces what we call core, a long cylinder of rock about the diameter of a soup can that's brought up to the surface for geologists like myself to study and to identify where gold veins are. These drill cores can range from hundreds of meters to over a kilometer deep. The problem with this is that it's a wildly inefficient system. A single drill hole can easily cost over $100,000. And often it takes tens if not hundreds of these drill holes to find a deposit and to determine how large it is. Think of that as throwing very expensive darts and trying to hit a bullseye. Now I'm downplaying this. We have gotten really good at throwing the darts over time, but there's still a large margin of error, and it's very common to miss a gold vein. So that brings me back to my first question. What if you didn't actually have to find gold to, you know, find gold? Well, my research is accomplishing just that. Here's how it works. Far into the past, gold was deposited by hydrothermal fluids, and that fluid interacted with the surrounding rock through a series of chemical reactions and created what we geologists call alteration. Simply a chemical change in a rock from its original composition into something different. These changes are measurable over much larger distances uh, than the gold veins themselves, ranging from 
centimeters away from a gold vein to up to 100 meters away, 100 meters away from a gold vein. And they also exist on a chemical continuum, depending on how close you actually are to the gold vein. I'm studying a gold deposit in Nova Scotia called Goldboro. And by analyzing thousands of meters of drill core, I'm finding that changes in the concentrations of elements like sodium, potassium, magnesium, and arsenic are useful in telling us how far away we are from an actual gold vein. Not only that, but we can use them to create alteration zones, like what's shown in the center of the slide here, that can be used to predict where gold will be. So ultimately, while we still need to throw the dart at the bullseye, the target becomes much larger, meaning less drill holes, lower cost, and most importantly, more gold for rings, coins, and computers. Unfortunately, it won't help you find the remote, but one day, maybe one day we'll get there too. Thank you. So much, Marco, for telling us about your research project that you're conducting here at Man. We're just going to wait a few seconds before we move on to the next participant. <clears throat> whenever you're ready. Thank you. The next participant is uh, Sabir Mansour, who is doing a Master of Electrical Engineering in the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science. And the title of the presentation is Design, Simulation and Analysis of a Passive House in its Renewable Energy System in Newfoundland. Over to you, Sabir. Uh, can you hear me? We okay, can. perfect. So uh, today I'm going to talk about a sustainable house model and how we can mitigate the adverse effects of climate change by adapting to a sustainable house design. For those who already don't know, in November last year, for the first time, more than 11,000 scientists from 153 countries have collectively declared climate emergency with the primary focus on greenhouse emission pollution and global warming. You might be thinking how global warming is linked to the world we live in. Well, majority of the houses use electricity for space heating or cooling. On an average, around 80% of the house energy needs are met with electricity and majority electricity around the world is produced by fossil fuel, hence causing, causing greenhouse gas emission. If we can adapt to this sustainable house model on an individual level, we can inquire, we, we can we only require small amount of electricity for the household use. This remaining electricity can be produced by either roof, rooftop solar panel or other renewable energy production. By the way, re renewable energy production are those who are known to have minimum effect on the environment. So the idea of reducing electricity consumption with an, with an energy efficient sustainable house with which uses passive house design four major components, as you can see in the picture. It has highly insulated walls with airtight envelope to maintain temperature inside the house. There are specially designed windows which are which are also known as triple glaze windows to block the heat transfer while allowing sunlight to enter the house for comfortable living. The main component of the uh, house is heating and exchange uh, heat ventilation system. This will allow the fresh air to enter the house while maintaining the temperature of the house. This is the first step towards a sustainable house model. We can reduce electricity consumption or space heating or cooling by up to 90% with the passive house model. Second step is to add a rooftop solar panel, as you can see in the picture, that is a capable of producing remaining electricity consumption of the house. So my research was to study energy efficient house and its renewable energy system for cold climate in Newfoundland. I recently developed passive house in flat rock, which is in fact first of its kind uh, in Newfoundland was studied. I have performed modeling, sim computer simulation and design rooftop for the uh, panel for the solar panel for the house. If we talk about construction of the house, obviously there are extra components involved, as you can see in the picture. It 
discovered that only 12% extra cost of construction of passive house was com was when compared to the normal house the payback period of this cost was only 17 year which means the house is saving enough electricity which is going to pay itself and generate revenue in terms of cost electricity saving so we can contribute to minimize uh, climate change by either retrofitting our existing house to a passive house model or design our need according to this energy efficient models thank you so much uh, Sadira for talking to us about your research project you can hear some feedback because your mic is still on so Thank you very much. So just a reminder to everybody, please don't turn your mic on until you actually start your presentation, because if not, that is going to affect um, the audio for everybody. But thank you so much, Sabir, for your presentation today. Just gonna wait a few seconds before we move on to the next person. Julie, could we please move on to the next slide? Thank you so much. So the next participant today is uh, Sarah Langer-Smith, who is doing a PhD in uh, Transdisciplinary Sustainability and the title of the thesis on potential, how artistic expression can change economics. Uh, over to you, Sarah. Drawing and economics? Well, we economists love graphs and we'll draw a graph for everything. But a graph will never tell us the whole story. Our imaginations of a good life are very restricted. Art is boundless in its imaginations and it has the, the ability to motivate change. And it always tells a story. Bogo Island has a story that led it to become a strong, sustainable community thriving on social, cultural, ecological, and economic assets or what we call resources. And it begins in the 1960s before their ordered relocation. A MUN film project came to document people's daily lives, life stories, hopes for the future, uncertainty about the loss of their community. The documentaries were meant to capture a community and culture before it was lost. Yet something amazing happened. The film made the community see their worth beyond what economics could never express. Film presented a dream for self-sufficiency and a desire to change their economy. It became about sustaining livelihoods, culture, and the environment. Economics is a tool to help what assets we have help us maintain what we value. For Fogo Islanders, community belonging, sense of place, connection to the environment, valuing a beautiful and sunny day are all assets. It can be expressed in beautiful photography and even quilting history we too can enjoy because of their transformation. Building on what's called the FOGO process, I focus on something a little more proactive, drawing, which is more engaging than film. Workshops, COVID depending, are about creating a space for people to expand their imaginations through drawing. We can have time to create a beautiful collection of assets, uh, of drawings that capture what their assets are and what they value beyond economics. Graphs can't do this. Their, their imaginations and drawings, economics as a tool, it all opens up an opportunity to collaborate on what their economy could be what it can evolve into. Newfoundland has no shortage of at-risk coastal communities, climate change, fishing moratoriums, the list goes on. But that's why it's imperative that we rethink economics. It's not working at the global level, let alone the provincial. Economics hasn't changed in 300 years. So let's go back to the drawing board together. Thank you. Much, Sarah, for telling us about your research project. Just going to wait a few seconds before we introduce the last participant for today, participant number 25.
Sarah, please feel free to turn off your camera now. Judy, could we please move on to the next slide? Thank you. And the next participant is uh, Jackie Bauman, who is doing a Master of Arts in Environmental Policy in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. And the title of the thesis is uh, Marine Special Planning and Community Capacity for the Great Northern Peninsula. Over to you, Jackie. Do we have the capacity to protect 25% of marine areas by 2025? I remember standing by the Atlantic Ocean feeling so excited the first time I saw a beluga whale. That moment was so rare and special that it made me want to learn how to protect this coast so others could feel this too. Now, can you imagine the experiences you've had with this ocean? What made these moments special? Maybe you enjoyed fishing with your family or the excitement of spotting birds or a whale like I did. The point is, we all have unique experiences which lead us to value this space differently. But if we can all agree that we see value in our ocean and coastline, then wouldn't we want to try our best to preserve its integrity? Marine spatial plans have great intentions to do this, but I've learned a common shortfall of setting such broad conservation targets is that there is no one size fits all solution to address the conflicts that happen at the community level. So if Canada wants to protect 25% of marine areas by 2025, what's that mean for the province of Newfoundland and Labrador? Or for the small fishing communities along the Northern Peninsula? This 25% target can't just be a number. And my community research aims to explore this gap like when I went out on a boat with a fisherman who told me about his family, I realized that if such targets are to apply here in the Northern Peninsula, they should be a reflection of the values held by the communities that depend on these marine areas. If we want to ensure our ocean's resources are abundant and our coasts are clean for future generations, we need the capacity at that local scale to establish viable conservation objectives. What I've learned so far in literature on past failures around the world is that by recognizing what local institutions already exist, we can build off them by engaging all stakeholder values to develop solutions based on the knowledge we create together, which can encourage more diverse and sustainable livelihoods that align with conservation values. If we take a step back from this target, we can see how interdependent conservation is with sustainable human activities in our coastal communities. We need to accept that humans are part of this ecosystem. Our values matter. So let's think deeper about what it is we're really trying to protect. Thank you. That's about your research project. Uh, and that was the last uh, presentation for today. So we have had uh, 25 uh, participants today. Uh, Julie, would you mind uh, moving on to the next slide? So now we're just going to take uh, a short break so that the judges um, can deliberate. And we'll be back uh, shortly. Okay, everybody, so just uh, bear with me for a few minutes while I get the judges in a breakout room. Thank you.
Hi, everybody. So the judges are in the breakout session now. Um, and they'll let me know if they have any questions uh, when they're ready. Francesca, I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to say or add at this time. Well, you take a short break and as, as we have the response, we can be back and announce uh, the winners. Short, short, great. Thanks.
Thank you for your patience, everyone. I'm just getting uh, right now the results from Julie, so we'll announce the winners in a few seconds. Thanks again for all the patience that you're having. Hi, everybody. It's Julie again. Um, just before every for Francesca gets started, if feel free to turn on your cameras and our 3 judges have their cameras on there. So you don't have to, obviously, but if you're comfortable, you can uh, put your camera on. Thank you so much, Julie, and thank you for the judges for sending in the results. I had to turn on my light because it became very dark in the meantime while we decided who the winners were. So, well, first of all, before I announce the winners, I just wanted to mention congratulations to everybody just because you participated and you really out there. And uh, I, when I say this, I really mean it. Mean it that it is not important to win. I know that getting, you know, the winning and getting the, the cash prize uh, is a perk, but it is not important to win. I did participate as a student uh, in the 3MT competition and I didn't win, but for me, it was a great experience and it really opened up a lot of doors for me. So you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing, get involved uh, and uh, you will do amazing. In everything that you're doing, I think that everybody else uh, from SGS and our judges here agree as well. So you see me, I didn't do that bad, even though I didn't win, right? Career wise. So and I'm here now hosting. So who knows? Maybe in a few years, there will be one of you being the MC for the 3MC competition. So now I know that you're very excited and you're very eager to hear about who the winners are. So I will start by mentioning that we actually have an honorable mention for today. Um, so we don't have, unfortunately, a cash prize for this uh, person, but the judges really wanted to have this honorable mention for today. And the honorable mention today goes to Janelle Skurd. So congratulations, uh, Janelle, for this. And everybody feel free to write your congratulations uh, in the chat box. I see everybody is clapping very silently, so it's really good to see all the cameras on. So congrats, uh, Janelle. Then I'll go with the third prize for today. So the third prize for the 2020 3MT competition from Memorial University goes to Indrayani Fartare. Congratulations. So congratulations, uh, Indrayani. And apologies again for the delay in having your slide there. I see that didn't affect. <laughs> so, um, thanks very much. Thank you, Indrayani. And the second prize today for the 2020 FMT Memorial Competition goes to Shreya Nemani. So, congratulations, Shreya. 
WebEx is saying they're detecting background noise. It's my clapping. So yes, WebEx. <laughs> so congratulations and second prize as well. And the winner, first prize of the 3NT competition today is Marzana Monefa. So congratulations, uh, Marzana. Yay! So congratulations, everybody. Uh, this was a wonderful 3NT competition. We all really enjoyed listening to your presentations. And it was really a pleasure to hear about all of your research projects today. I'm sure that SGS We'll be in touch with you when it comes to, you know, delivering <laughs> prizes to you. Thanks again, everybody. And I will just or anyone else from SGS wants to, to say a few words to close. Yes, thank you very much, Francesca, for hosting. Once again, you do such a good job. And thank you, Ashley, for keeping the time. That was really important. Uh, thank you to the judges. Um, you didn't have an easy job of this. Today, we had some really, really, everybody was just so great. And thank you for all for the audience for attending and everyone who participated. Um, I would like to maybe uh, the faculty of science 3 MT did this and I thought it was really neat. They got the 3 winners, um, to put their cameras on and then I could take a picture and we can use it for, our, uh. For promotion for our social media. So maybe if we could get everybody to just take off the camera besides our winners. That includes me if I can stop my video. There we go. And I'm gonna see if I can share. Okay. Has everybody got their cameras on? Okay. I'm going to take off the slide. Julie, I think if you ask them each to save something, they'll go to the top. Sure. All right, folks, would you have anything to say? We'd like to say a few words. Thank you. Yes, thank you all for um, recognizing and for supporting our research. This was a great opportunity. Thanks to everyone. Everyone was so good. I was like really surprising whatever is happening in every department. Really nice. Really nice. Thanks for this opportunity. Thanks to you all. And Duran, do you have anything to say? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. It was a really great experience. Great. Thank you very, very much. All right. So, um, I guess we're done. Um, I don't know, Francesca, if you have anything else to say. Thank you for all for coming. I just wanted to say congratulations again to, to the winners and congratulations to everybody who decided to participate. About your, um, listen to your presentations about your research projects and thanks again to the judges. For doing such an amazing work you had it was a lot of pressure because they were all so good right so it was a hard decision so thanks so much to the judges as well and thanks to sgs for inviting me and i hope everybody has a lovely night thank you congratulations everyone congratulations congrats you're all amazing wonderful good luck with your research <laughs> and and your careers you're off to great start wonderful